Welcome back to Toronto Speaks Legal Advice. I'm your host, Natalka Falkomer. We are joined today by one of Toronto's most prolific family lawyers, Andrew Feldstein. And we're answering your questions about your alternatives to divorce court. And before the commercial, we were actually talking about something that is so important. But none of us want to talk about it, the marriage contract. And we also have to talk about, I can't let this slip our minds, for those of you that are living common law, whether or not you also need an agreement. But we'll first focus on the marriage contract. What is it and what do we have to make sure we include in it? Well, I'll start with the most important part of a marriage contract is the process in which it's negotiated. Because if you don't negotiate it in the proper format, then you're risking later on someone saying to a judge or a court, uh, I want it set aside because it's unfair. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? It means both sides should have lawyers, it means you need to give full, frank financial disclosure. You should give your income tax returns, your banking information of how much you have in your accounts, your business assets, give everything. So right. the other side knows and understands what the contract is all about. The contract can deal with division of property. The contract can deal with spousal support. Mm -hmm. It cannot deal with custody or access of children. It cannot deal with child support. Mm -hmm. And it cannot deal with exclusive possession of a matrimonial home. Those are the things it can't deal with. Now what's uh, what's the difference, you say exclude, everyone hears about the house, the house, the house, the house. It's gonna be split no matter what. Um, of course, before I go down that path to our viewers at home, give us a call today. If you're getting married or if you know someone else that's getting married, give us a call and hopefully we can help maybe s just move away some of those potential roadblocks and issues as it comes up later on. But back to this possession versus actual value of that matrimonial home, et cetera. Can you say, fine, I will give up, I will not give up my right for possession, but I will give up my right for half the value of the home, for example? Well, it's not really half the value because it goes to what is an equalization payment. And in that sense, what we're trying to do is to say, husband, what is your net worth on data separation mm -hmm. subtracted by his net worth on data marriage mm -hmm, mm -hmm. same thing for the wife okay whoever has more pays half the difference to the one who has less that means you put the house on the side of the person that owns it interesting and we get it regularly get into a fight about well what happens if after separation and before they resolve the case the house has gone up in value if it's jointly owned it's easy they share in it mm -hmm. but if one person owns it then they're going to say, I want the entire increase. And in this real estate market, that's significant. Then you get into secondary arguments of with someone holding it in trust for the other side to share in that increase. What is that argument all about? And why would someone want to use that argument? Well, let's say I separate in 2014. Right. And now I'm finally about to resolve my case in 2018. Mm -hmm. And my house has gone up in value $300,000. Wow. The person who's on title is going to say, I want all the 300000 mm -hmm. The person who's not on title is going to say, I want to share in that 300000 yeah. And then they have to establish that they've done something to create a beneficial interest in the home. Mm -hmm. The easiest way to prove that is, let's say a lot of lawyers will put their homes in their wife's name because they're worried they're going to get sued. Of course. <laughs> so you would say, well, I paid for the house. So because I paid for it, you're holding it in trust. So you could, you could show mortgage payments as a good way to show that it was being held in trust. Mortgage payments, who paid the original deposit, right. things of that nature. Now, the better things to rebut that is if I get married and I own the house when I got married, mm -hmm. and I still own the house on the date of separation, it's much harder, and the other person didn't pay any money, it's much harder for them to get that trust interest. Absolutely, and to our viewers at home, if you're wondering what to do and how to put titles on, on your property should something come apart, give us a call and we're happy to help you today. Um, in fact, we do have some callers that are waiting. Now, just to wrap up quickly, um, the marriage contract, what is one important mistake that you see people make when they're putting that contract together that can allow it for it to be invalidated later on? As I said before, financial disclosure, okay. lack of independent legal advice, and not enough time. Don't give a marriage contract to your spouse a week before marriage and uh, say, sign it. Yes. You want to make sure you start the process well in advance because if somebody signs a contract the day before, which I've seen, they're going to say, the invitations went out, I was told if I don't sign it, there's going to be no marriage, Absolutely. and I was going to be horribly embarrassed. 
So I did what I had to do and signed it. And that works. That works in court saying, you know what, that invalidates a contract because of those reasons. It may work and it may not work. There's <laughs> nothing that's certain. So essentially, make sure you cover off those bases, give you enough time, get independent legal advice. Absolutely. Fantastic. And we're going to go to our first caller today. Mary, how can we help you? Hi. Hi, Mary. Go ahead. We're here to help. Okay. Uh, my husband and I have been separated seven years now. For a um, how long, Mary? We've been separated seven years. Seven years separated. Yes. And I did ask for a divorce and he refused to give me a divorce. And my first question is, I'm who, pays, who, who pays for the divorce? So I, I'm having trouble hearing unless, Andrew, you got the most of that. Um, Mary, so your question is, you've been separated for seven years, and you're wondering okay. who pays for the divorce? Yes. So who um, pays for the legal fees? Yes. For the legal fees of the divorce. Andrew, go yes. ahead. I'm sure you have some questions there. Well, if you're just worried about who's going to pay for the divorce, the choice is going to be one person is going to start the divorce application, and they're going to pay the fees for their lawyer if they choose to hire one, as well as the costs with the court. And they could ask a court to make an order to ask the other person to contribute some or all of the costs for that. And that's discretionary in a judge's uh, decision as to whether or not they want somebody to pay some costs for that. Mary, does that make sense to you? So essentially someone, yes. someone has to pay the file yes. application and then you can go. Now, how would Mary go about again, just to reiterate those steps? She'd go to court and ask for that the costs be separated or what well, would be the best when way? you fill out your application for divorce, there's a box that says costs. You tick off that box and then if you don't get an a, a response to your divorce application within 30 days you have to file an affidavit for divorce an affidavit for divorce and when you file that affidavit you would ask for some costs back and it's up to the judge whether or not they want to give you any costs Mary does that answer your question yes it does I mean, I have another question please pardon say that again I have another question please another question yes oh go ahead Mary sorry we're well, make sure that we help decipher this as much as possible. Go ahead. We have a Japanese child, and she really has to take care of the family. Most of the time, she has to. Um, I'm sorry, Mary. We we're just not able to hear you right now. Um, perhaps if you could. Hang up and give us a call later on. We'll get to your question later, as I think there's a little bit of a bad connection. So just hang up and give us a call back, Mary. What we can do is make sure that your TV's turned down all the way down, and we'll be able to help. Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, so just to wrap up, separation for seven years. We do have another call, of course, to our viewers at home. Keep on calling. We are here to help. But just to wrap up on Mary's point, one little quick thing. Filing a for a divorce, can it be opposed by the opposing party so let's say you're the wife you file for divorce can the husband say absolutely not I don't want to get divorced you can oppose a divorce mm -hmm. but there has to be a certain reason why and it's usually a temporary thing so the examples of what how you can oppose it if there are children and there's supposed to be child support being paid mm -hmm. then you can oppose it by saying there are not reasonable arrangements for child support I see and the court can't grant it until there are reasonable arrangements okay if there's a claim for exclusive possession of the matrimonial home okay you can delay it because once you become divorced you lose your claim for exclusive possession because only a spouse can make that claim Mm -hmm. Another area that it becomes important has to do with your benefits mm -hmm. because most likely you will lose your benefits when you become divorced. So until there's a full resolution of the matter in many cases, you may not be able to get divorced. Great point.